Hi, and welcome to Global Governance Futures, based out of the Global Governance Institute at University College London. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favourite books, other resources, listen to past shows and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. I'm delighted to welcome Nafis Ahmed to our podcast today. Nafis is an investigative journalist, founding editor, and chief writer for Insurge Intelligence and System Shift columnist at Vice's science magazine, Motherboard. He holds a DPhil in international relations from the University of Sussex and is the author of a number of books, including Failing States, Collapsing Systems, Biophysical Triggers of Political Violence, and A User's Guide to the Crisis of Civilization, which has also been turned into a great documentary, which I I really highly recommend checking out. Drawing upon his uh, research, Nafis is developing a unique form of what he calls systems journalism, intended to throw light on the true scale of the planetary crisis, how this crisis demonstrates the inevitability of the demise of the prevailing system, and what true systems change inside and out might look like. Uh, His work explores what it means to be in the midst of a fundamental civilizational transition where old paradigms are collapsing and giving rise to a lot of political turbulence and in Gramsci's words, morbid symptoms. However, he also believes that this is a moment, an opportunity to push for a new emerging paradigm, one in which we find ways to live together in our diversity and thrive within planetary boundaries. Uh, Much of his writing powerfully conveys this sense of living in momentous, unsettling times, a time when we need independent thinking and journalism if we're to thread the needle of uh, constrained breakdown and renewal. So thanks so much for joining us today, Nafis. Uh, Lots to talk about. Before we begin, if our pod crew on the call today could introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Jessica, and I work on the video editing and some of the research for the podcast. Hi, I'm Zoe. I do primarily um, research and sort of sorting out admin on the podcast. Great. Uh, So, Nafis, assistance thinking, uh, drawing on complexity science has definitely been on my radar uh, recently in light of the COVID crisis. However, as you'll know, it's still often overlooked or perhaps misunderstood by many international relations scholars and rarely features on our core syllabuses. Uh, Perhaps we can begin there. So why in 2020 is it so important when trying to understand global politics to think in terms of systems? Uh, Why do so many disaster risk experts now believe that this is an absolute imperative? And I'm also curious as to why it has proven such a challenge to think in systems terms outside the somewhat boutique silos, if you will, of disaster risk, ecosystem management and uh, military strategy. Thanks, Tom. Um, Well, pleasure to join you on the show. Um, um, And it's a big question that you've asked, actually. It's quite a big question. And I think it's something that Coming from an IR background, it's something I've grappled with from the beginning. And I guess I felt a sense of, um, you know, I felt a sense of frustration, you know, as an IR student. um, And also, you know, when I was doing my research and even after that, when I was teaching, I felt frustration at the lack of systems awareness within some of the main kind of disciplines of IR. And I think that's still like a quite serious deficit. Um, and I think there's lots of different explanations for it, but I think one thing is clear from we start from 2020, as you said, you know, how is it that 2020 gives us that big realization and wake up call that actually we really do need to, you know, to grapple with systems thinking. And I think we can really see this year the way in which so many things have kicked off at the same time. You know, we've had obviously the big pandemic. Um, And the pandemic has acted as a kind of an amplifier um, for stresses and and tensions that have existed for for many years, many even decades. Um, And in a way, we can really see how the pandemic, because of the way it's impacted 
the nature of our global system and the systems within it. Um, it's really highlighted those interconnections and, uh, and, and the deep seated structural fragilities that, that you know, have existed for some time, but how you know, a major crisis like this kind of emerges from those structural fragilities and then further amplifies them. You know, so we know that the pandemic is a kind of a symptom of some of the core processes of industrial civilization. I think this is something that is now being discussed a bit more. It's still not really entered mainstream consciousness. I mean, there's still this sense of all oh, this thing came out of the blue and, you know, you know, now we just have a public health crisis and let's just get a vaccine and everything will be fine. But obviously, what we're, what we're really seeing is that, well, this happened because of the way in which our societies are expanding and encroaching into, um, you know, natural ecosystems, into wildlife, and obviously the tightly coupled nature of our global transport systems, all that kind of stuff, which has played a massive role in increasing our vulnerability, which is why people have been warning about the inevitability of a pandemic this, um, you know, either in the 20th century or 21st century, I think, many people were saying, look, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when, and, and this is why. So on the one hand, we know that it's because of a pre-existing system, which perhaps, you know, some of us are looking at it and trying to understand it, but perhaps overall, we, you know, in terms of decision-making and in terms of really kind of uh, people who have that responsibility to drive decisions in our societies, that lack of awareness of these systems and how they're working is, is, has created this vulnerability. And then further, we've seen so many things happen this year in terms of the continued risk from climate change. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, we had a respite with carbon dioxide emissions, but they've continued to rise and they've continued to be in the danger zone despite that respite. Um, we've seen this year the massive impact following the pandemic on the energy system and, and the oil industry and the massive oil price collapse, collapse which is unprecedented. Um, but which again, vulnerabilities were warned about for many years and the pandemic acted as kind of like a tipping point, you know, really just pushing all of those things over into an accelerated decline. Um, and we've also had the kind of the, I guess the political context of this increased polarization um, along right and left and you know with anti-lockdown skepticism and as well as you know the Black Lives Matter uprisings and so that has shown how in, in this wider context of strained systems you know one of the first things that happen is is people are affected and people will come out on the streets and they will protest and they may be civil unrest and all that kind of stuff um, so we have these different domains and I think what we're seeing is that you can look at all of these things separately and, 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 and understand them, but until you really take a bigger picture and see, well, wait a minute, how are these things actually interconnected? You then, that, that then allows you to say, well, actually, you know, to what extent are these wider risks and processes part of this, this system, which is in this big transition which is fundamentally about this system's relationship with, with the earth system. And I think that's often missing. So, you know, when you trace it back, that, that connection with the earth and the connection with, in a, in a, in a way, when you, you know, taking the Black Lives Matter movement and then rooting it back in this crisis that our civilization is facing with the earth system. And of course, and then, you know, the pandemic in between. For me, that really highlights the complexity of what we're dealing with, that there really is something going on here. Um, that connects all these things. And so we can see that, you know, systems thinking is a way of being able to really start to join those dots and develop a framework or, or frameworks for exploring this. Um, but I think in terms of IR, IR obviously does offer systems approaches to some extent, but I guess it's the way in which those systems are interpreted. You know, of course, so there's, there's the kind of the orthodox IR theory of, of the state system which focuses on the state as the core unit, which you know, I found particularly frustrating because what is the constitution of the state? And you know, is it really sufficient to talk about the state as the fundamental unit and national interest and things like that? So there's all sorts of problems there. And I think what we're seeing is if you are unable to grasp the complexity of, of, of a system and not just 
a system, but to realize actually you're dealing with multiple different subsystems and they all have. And that's the thing is like the level of analysis at that level is not completely false. Of course, there's a state system, of course, there's national interests. But if that's your only level of analysis, you simply won't see how the system is actually operating. You'll miss the you miss the political economy part. You'll miss you miss the the social relations uh, by which um, states are embedded in all sorts of you know. There's an economic context and there's also environmental context, and you'll miss the way in which all of that is interconnected. And and so I think it's a case of saying. It's not it's not so much about we, we throw out, you know, orthodoxy and we, and we become we all become Marxists or something like that. Although I, I would say I certainly position myself with with a critical stance on orthodox theory. And I'm certainly more I would situate myself theoretically as a, as a political Marxist. But having said that, you know, I think the value of systems thinking is being able to see how these approaches do actually provide important insights from a certain lens, but you have to be able to step back and see that it's just a lens. And actually your theory is a tool, it's just a tool to understand how a certain subsystem is working. And it's really important to be able to step outside of that lens and see how those theoretical tools can be used and applied in relation to other theoretical tools and, and to build up a a wider systemic framework to see how it all fits together. So that's, I guess, what I'm trying to do to some extent with my academic and journalistic work is, is to move outside of the kind of very polarized ideological divisions that sometimes develop around these things and to say, you know, we can still have those positions and, and we can have our biases and our, and our, and our worldviews and our sense of what we think really works as an explanatory framework, but we still have to be able to navigate beyond those things and see how things fit together. Yeah, thank you, Nafis. So that was a fantastic sort of crash course in, in what systems thinking might bring to this conversation. Uh, and I, I, I know you probably read Robert Jervis's classic book, Systems Effect, it came out in 1997. I, I read it recently. I wonder a little bit why that didn't revolutionize the field, um, but perhaps it's time to pick it up again. Uh, so, I mean, to ground that a little more, of course, systems thinking also brings into play the issue of causation, particularly causation in a context of nonlinear change. And as Robert Jervis makes very clear, it's not so much that um, systems are more than the sum of their parts, it's that systems are actually different to the sum of their parts. And if we sort of make that abstract observation concrete in the light of COVID, you said yourself that even well-informed risk analysts have been surprised at how dramatic the impact of the COVID situation has been on infrastructure, on basic state functioning. Um, of course, we see some states performing pretty well, of course, Taiwan, New Zealand, Norway, but then others really performing uh, much less well, including those who were apparently best prepared for a pandemic, such as the UK and the US. And I wanted to ask, um, uh, are, do you think states are perhaps even maladaptive when it comes to effectively dealing with these kinds of complex systemic global problems? Um, and to maybe make the question even more acute, do states know how to govern chronic problems? So we have approached COVID as kind of an emergency situation, but as you've suggested, the drivers of COVID lie also in much broader systemic shifts, such as deforestation and environmental degradation. And these are problems which are going to be solved necessarily in the, in the, in, at least in the immediate term. So do states know how to deal with those kinds of chronic, possibly insoluble problems that we're just going to have to live with? Yeah, I mean, these are good questions. I mean, I, I don't really, think states as they're currently structured are particularly useful vehicles for dealing with most of our challenges as species um, because they actually have created those problems um, and I think this is the irony is that we're looking at uh, you know existing governmental structures and, and I mean let's face it to some extent they're operating as captured entities for all sorts of interests around the way in which we consume um you know material goods and you know the, the kind of over exploitation of fossil fuels and other 
kind of mineral resources. And that process has led to the overshooting of these planetary boundaries and has put us in this situation where we're facing these emergencies. And what's interesting about this is that having created this problem because of the structures that exist, we're incapable of actually really anticipating the scale of the problem because of the narrow way in which we tend to see things and make decisions. And of course, again, it, you know, when I'm saying we, you know, sometimes, you know, we can get lost in the royal we. And what I, what I really mean is, you know, it's, it's the, the specific institutions that we use to make these decisions, whether it's the state or whether it's political parties or whether it's um, even, you know, NGOs or whether it's international institutions. And of course, I think, I guess when we go back, when we're looking at a lot of the locus of power is around very large, you know, sometimes multinational conglomerates, um, which have a very kind of powerful influence on the decision making, the political apparatus of the state. And that's, you know, it doesn't really matter where you sit politically. I mean, that's pretty much very well known. We can see it happening all the time. And that's part of the problem is that that decision making apparatus is not even focused on um, dealing with problems. The political apparatus is focused on, you know, getting into power every four years and making sure you have enough money to win your campaigns to do that. Um, and when you when you're finally in in you know you're there you know your 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 objectives are so short term. You're about delivering something within the next within four years so that you can win the next term. You know it's it's just so narrow. It's nothing to do with what's actually real and going on in the world in a sense. To some you know to some extent. And I think that's the problem we're dealing with. Is that there's such a disjuncture between our institutions and what's actually happening and I think that's the problem so in that sense that broad sense I think definitely our states are not fit for purpose we don't have in order to deal with these complex issues we need to have kind of what in what I would call collective intelligence or I use the term public networked intelligence which I try to convey this idea of a sense in which in which people and publics and communities or, or nations, or whatever you want to call it, whatever level, are able to accurately see, you know, perceive their environment and then be able to organize coherently in response to what's what's happening. And that obviously this idea of intelligence and this idea of collective intelligence com comes in. And I, the reason I use public networked intelligence, because I want to distinguish between this idea of, of mechanized collective intelligence, which has become quite a popular idea amongst people in the tech community, this idea that you can just apply AI to, you know, the study of various things. And that's going to, you know, machine intelligence will produce understanding of trends and certain things, and, and that's going to produce the answers. And actually, it's that's obviously a useful tool to have. And I'm sure we can gain a lot from that. But it's not going to give us, as, as, as people, the ability to actually make decisions because you know even if you have a machine thing producing loads and loads of things and ideas and information you still need people to be able to process that understand it integrate it into decisions for our lives in a sense you know wisdom you know that i think that's what's missing so the question really is how do we get to a point where we can do that and i think if we're looking at the covid thing to get to to, to answer your question really directly at the moment there's a there's a real division between Countries in East Asia, for example, which appear to have identified a way of, you know, it's not it's not a perfect solution, but it's a way of saving as many lives and livelihoods as possible. You know, they've minimized uh, the economic damage. I mean, of course, there's no doubt they're still facing quite serious economic problems, but they've minimized that damage and they've also minimized um, the number of deaths compared to what's going on in the US and UK and places like that where we've had the complete opposite. We've had the worst of, of all worlds. We've had absolute destructive impact on the economy worse than anywhere else. An absolutely destructive impact in terms of the number of deaths and the overwhelming of the healthcare systems. And those have happened at the same time. And it's interesting that the Anglo-American model is, is a neoliberal model. It's one in which the state, which is already, as we've said, is a, is a flawed institution, but it's about in a, say, in a sense, you know, contracting the state and hem and and essentially, you know, it's really just uh, reducing the role of the state in making decisions about the economy and, and and issues of concern to the public, and bringing in you know private actors more into that. 
and you know allowing the market to solve things whereas in east asia i would say that the role of the even, even though these are still most often capitalist you know country, economies but they still have a, a, a much a more different idea of the role of the collective and the role of the state in which individuals have a greater stake a greater responsibility for each other um, a, a very different role for the idea of the state. The state has is recognized as having a legitimate role in organizing the affairs of the economy to some extent. And that's, you know, not saying that, you know, you need to have jump into, you know, complete and utter top down central planning or something like that. But I think it's really interesting that in response to a crisis, those countries have been far more equipped to be able to respond than, say, the US and the UK. And that to me says, that what's missing here is that you know you, you need you do need to have some kind of apparatus which represents the public interest which is able to organize coherently and to respond coherently to crisis without the influence of vested interests and so on and so forth and if you have an approach which just elevates the market and says you know less affair you know let the market solve everything you you're, you're going to just end up destroying yourselves. The market cannot solve complex social and global problems. The market needs to be designed, it needs to be calibrated, it needs to be have a structure. You can't just let the market do everything by itself. And I think we're now we've seen this empirically proven before our eyes that the market is not going to solve, it's not fit for purpose, it's not going to solve. And so states which I think move into that direction using the market as their ultimate problem solving tool and, and leaving everything to that and leaving, you know, deregulation, rampant deregulation and privatization. They're, they're, what we've seen is that that's kind of head for complete disaster. You need to have human beings in the driver's seat, making decisions and intelligent decisions about what's going on in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's that's a very important point there, of course, also because these actors, in a sense, frame what is salient in the landscape. They frame, to use an expensive word, the ontology of how we make sense of these problems, whether we even see the problem in the first place. And I guess that speaks a little bit to sort of this question of why are global biophysical drivers, as you, as you put it, of human system destabilization so really front and center in foreign policy analysis in in the media in the the news um and i i was thinking you know we can argue that market actors perhaps are not interested in putting those issues front and center for public consumption one of the actors which is seemingly um analyzing and understanding these dynamics are military actors we see reports coming out of the pentagon out of the Ministry of Defence. Um, so they are representing a particular constituency and they are concerned, it seems, with the uh, prospects for you know, biophysical triggers, changes over the next medium to long term over the century. But it's not just, say, those actors out there, but also perhaps in the academy. I've noticed there's a resistance among political scientists, historians sometimes to, to consider the possibility that climate change itself could be a prime mover affecting the course of history. People like Peter Turchin, who has devised this kind of science, historical science, predictive science, uh, he, he's, he, he really thinks that a lot of the drivers of history will be sort of human system drivers, inequality among the rich and the poor, the, the Thomas Piketty kind of model, well, I think you're suggesting actually that we need to take the biophysical drivers much more seriously. There's quite a lot there. Sorry, <laughs> you might want to unpack that a bit. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, and I think I think it's the um, it's the interaction between uh, the human system and the Earth system that is the key issue, and which I think a lot of political theory tends to miss. I think most social science theory is focused on um, is focused on the human system. Um, which again is totally legitimate area of study, but that's not going to tell you anything about the earth system. And it's not going to tell you anything about the relationship between the human system and the earth system. And I think that's the problem the, the way in which our academic disciplines have developed has been in the context of, I think, you know, it's, it's a historically, it's a historically kind of specific 
circumstance that we've you know we happen to have had this transition into a form of science which tends to you know want to take things apart to understand them and i think that's worked really well in the sense it's produced all sorts of very important discoveries about the universe you know also about you know how we work as you know as you know in our, our biology it's produced tangible um you know i mean like quant the quantum physics isn't just about amazing cosmological insights but it's also given us huge technology technolo i mean there's so many technological things in our daily life which are actually due to our insights into the quantum realm um and you could say the same for medicine you know medical development so there's no doubt that that's it's it's worked to some extent but it's all taken place within this I mean, when we you step back again and we see it's taken place in this context of accelerating kind of growth and, and consumption which is now leading us into this crisis state so we then have to ask ourselves is this really the the only way to do this and, and when we look a little deeper what we're seeing is that we've got the capacity to take things apart and it's almost like you know we hold a magnifying glass up to things and that that shows us what's going on at that level but if we're holding up that magnifying glass and walking around you know you're bound to bash into something or hit a wall you have to be able to step back and see how those things you're looking at do fit together and that's what's missing from our scientific approaches across the natural and social sciences where we've we've gone into these domains and we've had this disciplinary specialization going deeper and deeper into you know i want to understand um you know i want to understand the natural world i want to understand biology i want to understand you know political economy i want to understand um, you know feminism and gender studies i want to understand this that that whatever and all again all those things are completely legitimate areas of study and specialization but if that's all we're doing then how do we connect these up how do we connect these insights together we don't have frameworks to do that and so we've we've lost that sense of of um, of a holistic whole system approach and i think that's really the biggest challenge of our time is being able to find ways to bridge that to build up these whole systems approaches and to realize that what we're dealing with here are these are these multiple systems which are legitimate study in their own right but when we bring them together we can start to see how things work overall and when we do that we're able to see a much bigger picture and i think that's the the the, the problem we've got in academia is that you know we've had decades of this going on and to some extent we have entrenched structures and institutions and ways of thinking and there's a certain inertia around that but also there is a there is a sense in which so much of our political institutions and economic institutions have become embedded in that way of being and that way of doing things that they don't really want to to change and and i think the do you know the the, the defense institutions are a really good example of that in the sense that yeah so because they deal with security and they want to look at long-term security trends or and even short-term security issues and they've and they've seen that well there are these biophysical things and the only reason they're interested in those biophysical drives is because it ticks that security box that oh well wait a minute climate change might actually amplify the risk of warfare so now because we need to understand warfare we need to understand how climate change can amplify that and it's only from that lens so it's from that kind of it's with from from that narrow again slightly ideological sense of assumptions about what we should be doing and so the results then are skewed as well you know when the, the the reports that come out are skewed towards the securitization of these biophysical issues rather than actually understanding you know that the implications of this go far beyond a securitization approach which would actually make things worse and i think this really came home to me i did a story a couple of months ago on um, the british uh, military um had commissioned um i think the rand corp to do a study on climate change and this was going to feed this is feeding into um britain's whole kind of climate strategy and specifically the uk military's climate strategy and the rand report was just like well basically temperatures are going to rise by three to four degrees celsius by 2100 um so all these bad things are going to happen and, and that's what we need to plan for and it was quite astonishing because it was telling policy makers that this is the scenario that you have to prepare for because this is basically what's going to happen rather than saying 
this is one business as usual scenario, which we have to, of course, plan for and prepare for. But we should we would urge the government that they can mitigate these security risks by not <laughs> not having a three to four degree Celsius temperature rise. And it's like this is not this is not rocket science. It's obvious. It's it's and it's like that that little bit of step from as a military institution we can we should advise on this is the kind of strategy to avoid these outcomes what's what's difficult about making that why is that a leap to say that why is that going outside the boundaries of what a military institution should do why is it perceived that the military should only just say well these are the risks these are the threats and let's pour more money into preparing for you know radicalized crazy meltdowns of society you know which is a recipe for absolute disaster because if all you're doing is preparing for that meanwhile you're guaranteeing the continued rise in emissions and all the processes that are driving all this crisis in the first place so it's this kind of what we're finding is that the the, the, the existing frameworks of thinking are so self-limiting that they actually prevent us from responding to what's actually going on it's, we, we only look at one sphere of it and we respond to that and we tend to make things worse it's kind of like the 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 regressive response to black lives matter for instance which is oh it's people on the street civil unrest let's just get more police out well you're only going to make things worse because you're looking at this tiny tiny lens and it's like you're not wrong in saying that yes there's people on the street but you're missing the point when you're not looking at why people are on the street as a result of the institutions that put them there so that's what's missing is this inability to kind of step back and say, wait a minute. And I think that's, that's what worries me. I'm really worried that our current institutions are locked into this frame of thinking. Uh, and it's just this, you're kind of doubling down on, on the assumptions that you've used to, you know, that have got us into this and you, and you're kind of making that worse. So here in the UK, for instance, with the, the talk recently about it came out i think a couple of weeks ago that the teaching in schools um you're not allowed to talk about if you have um criticisms of capitalism this could be considered potentially extremist um and that's not going to be allowed in schools um the teaching of, of critical race theory um without showing without acknowledging that there are it's just a theory and it might be wrong is not going to be allowed so this weird radicalization of our education system that's going on that is saying let's push out i mean you know you have masses and masses of peer-reviewed scientific studies which are talking about the problems of capitalism and not in an ideological way purely and even in a technocratic way and saying we need to do this we need to do that and if someone like george soros for example who is a capitalist has openly spoken about um the deep-seated problems and weaknesses of, of capitalism why is it that we cannot have frank and open discussions in classrooms about these issues? It's quite astonishing that that's the, the way in which things are moving. So there is there really is a need for people in these positions to, to step back outside of their ideological kind of, you know, little kind of windows that they're looking at things to say, well, if we really do want to make sure that our own children aren't going to get kind of del deluged in this, in, in, in a terrifying spiral, um, then, you know, we need to take responsibility for how we're talking about things, how we're thinking about things. And it isn't just about the next term. And I think this is what I always try to urge people in these different institutions to think about is that, look, it's really is, it's about your own family. It's about your own networks. It's about all the people around you and the legacy that you're going to leave. All those people who are, who are, who are around you are going to have to face up to the consequence of those decisions those making the way you're using those words so you have to take that responsibility unless you want to see the consequences in your own in your own context i think jess has a, a question yes thanks very much nafiz um i had a question about your role as an investigative journalist um which leads very well after what you were saying um about where we get our information and um i find that a lot of the uh, public consciousness is taken up by sources that are highly partisan, uh, ideologically leaning. Um, and you mentioned earlier that 
mechanized public information sharing through AI and machine learning is has its faults um, and an inability to put systems together and create uh, connections um, that really only human wisdom can do. So in your role as an investigative journalist, how do you speak truth to power in the most effective way? And, and is investigative journalism a good tool for disseminating and commenting on multifaceted global issues? Yeah, that's a, re a really good question. And I think um, as an investigative journalist, I guess, I guess I went through a bit of a, almost a kind of a midlife crisis uh, at some point when I kind of looked back and I thought to myself, what has the actual impact of some of my reporting been? Um, and I'll give you an example, actually, a very tangible one. Um, one of them, the, the first, what really, what th the first it, things which threw me into investigative journalism when I was quite young um, was investigations into 9-11 and looking at um, problems with the 9-11 narrative and issues around the way in which uh, governments had made decisions around national security and specifically connections with uh, states that were funding Islamist terrorism. So for example, our relationships with Saudi Arabia, our relationships with states like Pakistan or Turkey or Azerbaijan. Um, and I guess one of the basic arguments or insights that emerged from that was that the reason that we had so much um, intelligence blind spots in the run-up to the 9-11 attacks and you know, there were all sorts of warnings coming in and stuff, but they were just ignored and you know the national security system kind of went into a paralysis is because of these cross-cutting institutional um, relationships that existed and also personal relationships as well you know to with there's some of the Bush family and all that kind of stuff, you know, their relationships with um, the Saudi kingdom and even members of the Bin Laden family. So all that context, which had this dampening effect on the ability of the national security system to respond. And I, I remember one of the things I used to talk a lot about was um, this link between our intelligence agencies, the historic link and their use of Islamist groups for geopolitical purposes, of course, something well known during the Cold War with, you know, the war in Afghanistan, for example, and the funding of the Mujahideen in order to counter Russian power, but also some, it was something that actually continued after the Cold War uh, for very much the same kind of reasons. Um, and it was something that, again, you know, as you can imagine, it's not politically correct to talk about these things. It's, it's seen as, are you offering a conspiracy theory? So I didn't want to offer conspiracy. I didn't want to um, undermine the fact that you know, Islamist extremism is real, but I wanted to draw attention to these wider processes. But what I found is that having banged on and on about those kind of issues, um, to some I was gratified to find that, I mean, this work, you know, influenced um, official inquiries. I mean, my book was um, read by 9-11 commissioners. Um, it became part of, you know, the 9-11 families had actually, one of, one of my books on the first they, I think it was the first they had read and they'd used it to inform the lines of inquiries that they were asking the, the US government. So on the one hand, it was gratifying to see all of this impact. But on the other hand, what I found was that people then began taking those, I mean, conspiracy theorists were taking my work right from the beginning and saying, you know, yeah, 9-11 is an inside job. Um, Nafis has used the word complicity. So that means that the US government has, has, has perpetrated 9-11 and that kind of thing. And it just turned into this slippery slope. And I watched as these ideas then kind of just this, this meme of the idea of, oh, the CIA funds Islamists, the CIA funds Islamists, the CIA funds. It just became this really toxic discourse to the point where you, you know, fast forward to a crisis in Syria. And then I found that people were taking these same sorts of ideas. And of course, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, I've done a lot of reporting on the Syria crisis um, but what happened is that people then began denying Assadists' crimes against people in Syria by saying that, well, there's funding of jihadists' groups in Syria by, um, you know, the US government and so on and so forth. Um, you know, Saudi is putting money into, and of course, Saudi was and is, has been putting money into rebel groups, and they have been Islamist groups and all sorts, totally legitimate. But then that led, that turned into war crimes denialism and saying that, well, Assad's not actually you know, that's all fabricated. It just turned into this really strange, toxic discourse and very polarized. And, and, as, and that's an example of, of 
what happens when you kind of narrow down on something and take it out of context and you you know you don't think systemically about these issues and that that was for me a real kind of you know I had to take I felt that I even as a journalist was contributing to some of the toxic discourses in Syria as a reporter. Um, and I, I ended up doing a massive report for um, the, the state crime initiative uh, out of uh, Queen Mary's, um, looking at the way in which these narratives had developed and just investigating them and, and, and just really digging deep. And I think that's what I, what I, what, what I learned from that is that investigative journalism is really important in order to shine a light on things and to and to to understand how things work, but it has to be done responsibly, and it has to be done in the context of understanding systems, and that's something that as as journalists we really have to take that responsibility seriously. And when we don't take that seriously, there is a danger that it feeds into these polarizing narratives, which are being fed by different interest groups. You know, you have the United States government with its own interests, and you have Russia, and you have China, and you have different entities with their different interests. And as a journalist, we don't want our 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 um you know our, our work to be co-opted by any of these interest groups. Really, we want it to be something that the public can take to make informed judgments about what's going on, which are not politicized by by these interest groups, and and which have value in sense of throwing real light on what's on the plight of, of you know what victims are going through and then we can see the, the role of all of these groups you know what are russia's interests what are the u.s government's interests what are saudi's interests what are china's interests what are the communities that are struggling on the ground that kind of thing you know to really see it in its complexity and that's what's happening now is that we have investigative journalism being used as a tool to to, to, to really just suit very narrow political agendas on either the left or the right. And that's very toxic because it just means that you, you don't care about what's actually going on in the world. You're not worried about criticism and analysis of your own side, for instance. It's just about proving that you're right and proving that your position is correct and the other side is wrong. And that's why I'm very wary of this. And one of the things I hear a lot is, is people quote Noam Chomsky and they'll say, well, Chomsky said that that, you know, if you're in the West, then it's the, your priority is to focus on the West. And, you know, I'm a great fan of Chomsky and I love Chomsky's work. And, and I think what he wasn't trying to say was that you focus on the West in this absurd myopic way to the point that you erase the crimes of non-Western states, but, but, but that you don't allow your criticism of non-Western states to, 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 to basically, you know, kind of, elevate the west to this to this level which is which is dishonest i think that's really the point moral point he was trying to make and that obviously if we're situated in the west then our you know we should be concerned about where we can have that immediate sense of impact but that doesn't mean that we should turn a blind eye when our discourses and our narratives are going to undermine the rights of people in china for example like the Uyghur minority i mean again the polarization has gone there where you've had people on, there are some people on the left who are just absolutely denying there's anything going on with the repression of the Ouija on the grounds that there are people with vested interests in the United States who are attacking China and, and have vested interests against China. And it's kind of like, but your job as a journalist is to not get caught up in that politics, but to see what's going on. There's always going to be vested interests on different sides, whether it's Russia and, or China or the United States. Our job is to step outside of that and be able to see, well, actually what's going on. Then it may be that some of the sources, some of the people who are talking about the repression of the Ouija, for example, have vested interests and have biases, but is what they're saying true? You know, let's look at the data that they're pointing out and see whether it's corroborated. What about the witness testimony that's coming out? Is that, you know, is it valid? You know, there's an overwhelming case. So that's just an example to say, you know, we, it's it's difficult, but and, and but I think that ethos is something that's really important for people to to take on. And I think the more the more of us take that on, the more we can hold journalistic institutions to account to to, to ask them to look. Can you be more responsible in the way you're doing your reporting? Jess, do you have a follow up? 
Yes, um, touched on a number of potent issues. Um, you spoke about uh, journalistic responsibility and ensuring that the reporting that you're doing isn't necessarily influenced by a partisan agenda. But yet it is impossible to control where your information goes after it's been shared and um, who uses it and to what advantage. So what are the steps that you would take, I suppose, to speak truth to power in a way that is non-biased and allows you to maintain your own integrity? Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, I think, I think you have to be really specific and intentional about the reporting that you're doing. And sometimes that means making really clear, you know, things that you're not gonna stand by or things that you're not saying. Um, but it's not easy. I mean, you can't take responsibility for, you know, crazy people who are doing crazy things with your, with your work. Um, it's not necessarily your fault. But when you, when you do, if you do see that happening, you, you know, you, you can try to dampen it down. Um, so I think it's about um, writing well or reporting well or making your videos well, you know, and again, taking, when you, taking, taking a systems approach. And when I talk about systems journalism, I mean, my approach is, is grounded in, I guess, the academic work that I've done. And I've always been in kind of tried to look at, if I'm taking a systems theory background approach, then when I come to understand what's going on in a climate issue or what's going on in, you know, in the food system or looking at, for example, a particular conflict, I will try to apply that systems lens to understand what's really going on there. So I think to some extent it is about saying, if, I, if I'm able to see that what's going, the issue that's going on here is not just about evil groups of people or evil entities, it's also about the systems that incubate them. Um, and the processes and decisions that incubate them. And sometimes when you, it, it's about drawing that attention, say so that's, that's the lesson I want to take away. So for instance, you know, we were talking about the Ouija earlier on. One of the things that I've done, one of the stories I did was about how Huawei, the, you know, the big um, telecoms company in, in China um, that people have spoken about is, um, you know, having it's got a relationship with various Western companies and all the rest of it. Well, Huawei was um, essentially built by companies like IBM. Um, and IBM and other companies like Microsoft and others played a big role actually in nurturing the kind of surveillance oriented policies of, of, of that company. And even when it became securitized and it became used by Chinese police and military institutions, that was still going on. In fact, IBM still um, has this relationship with, with, with Huawei where they, where they give them, um, I can't remember the exact number, but they give them a quite hefty fee every year. Um, and, it's a, and it's a consultancy fee and IBM will go and advise them and so on and so forth. And Huawei is, 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 is known, documented to be directly involved. Um, it's, it's technology is directly involved in policing uh, the Ouija people in, in the Xiangyang region. Um, and involved in those kind of detention camps and so on and so forth. So that, but when you take that step back and you, and you can see, well, how did Huawei actually come into existence and, and go down this line and who was advising it and what were those interests and how did those interests feed back into kind of the capitalist Western infrastructure? That's then makes you ask quest systemic questions about what's going on. And then you can see that it's not, it isn't just about China and China doing terrible things and because China's bad, but it's about this wider system and how we have actually, all of us together, including China, have helped to usher in this system that has taken this very, very toxic, dangerous form in China, which of course the Chinese state is, you know, fundamentally responsible for, but that doesn't absolve Western institutions of their own responsibility either. And then it allows you to look and say, well, when we have you know, the Trump administration railing against China and jumping up and down, and suddenly Trump cares about Muslims in China, <laughs> then you can step back and say, well, actually, you don't really care about Muslims in China. This, this is a geopolitical thing for you. And what have you done about the active companies in the United States, which have been feeding to this day, this machine that you are saying is, is a problem? Um, and are you going to do anything about that? 
so it's about allowing so when you take that wider lens and you you know it's, so again i think it's about that ethos and you have to kind of take that ethos really intentionally and use that to 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 understand what's going on and then to follow those conclusions and hopefully you can produce stories which are which are hard hitting and powerful and eye opening but still very balanced um and also give people a sense of what comes next you know what are the changes what are the systems that need to change what are what, what are the things which are actually wrong with our surveillance society and our culture and our technology and what can we think about doing differently yeah and surely there's also lots of scope for academics and students to be looking at how these states such as China and Western states and, and others are operating or pursuing their interests through these kinds of transnational networked private governance channels. I don't think there's much scholarship yet on that. And certainly I think that's a really important domain for us to, to explore and to dig, dig into. Um, I know Zoe's got a question, so I'm going to hand over to Zoe. Yeah, so kind of following on from that in terms of what comes next and, you know, without wishing to fall into the poorly informed utopian and dystopian views. Um, what would a resilient system look like? And how can we set a course towards a fundamentally fairer and more sustainable and viable human earth system for the future? So I did, a, I've actually just published a report with the Schumacher Institute where I'm a fellow um, uh, called uh, Deforestation, Deforestation and the Risk of Collapse. Um, and this report focused a lot on some, some of the kind of questions that we're talking about um, with a big focus on deforestation, but in the context of these wider systems and this breaching of planetary boundaries as, as the big context for how we got into this pandemic um, and how we can try to reduce the risk of future pandemics. So this is something I address in that report in more detail if, if listeners want to go and read something. Um, but I think my, my answer to that would be um, to draw on, and I mentioned this idea in the report, but this this concept of ecological civilization, which I think David Corton um, is an author who, you know, he's a former um, Harvard Business School guy, you know, worked for USAID for 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 a long time, you know, very kind of senior official in that, but and then kind of you know had had a wake up call and was like, this isn't working. What he you know from seeing the things he was seeing. Um, and he's been calling for this idea of ecological civilization, the idea of a civilization which thrives within planetary boundaries. Um, so I think the first shift that we need is, I call it, I'm calling it a lifeboat economy, this idea of moving away from this lesser fare, this economy that just, you know, which does things by itself. Um, and moving into this very intentional idea of an economy that it works to protect people. Um, I think there really does need to be a fundamental paradigm shift about how we think about what an economy is supposed to do. And to me, I think the pandemic offers an opportunity to do that rethinking and it kind of, because it really has hit home how if we didn't have government stepping in to create safety nets for people, but, you know, for doing things, you know, furlough and all the rest of it, here has done, you know, been done quite incompetently and so on. But I think what we're seeing is the pandemic has forced us into this structural position where, you know, if you let the virus rip, you're going to overwhelm your healthcare systems. You're going to, you know, you, you, you know, end up collapsing your economies in one, in one way. And that's been modeled, you know, the collapse of GDP that would take place if, if, if you just allowed the pandemic to continue. And if you lock down, of course, you know, you try and respond um, there's good, obviously an economic consequence and there is massive GDP crisis. So whichever way you look at it, and even if you do an in-between approach, you know, with East Asia, which in the World Bank's recently said that they're facing a kind of a triple crisis, even though they've got the best of those worlds, you know, they've saved as many lives and lives as they can, but they're still facing that consequence. So I think the pandemic is kind of, I've argued that when you take this wider systems approach, it's almost like a tipping point. You know, we've tipped over into this kind of slightly new shift in the, in the global system and the economy is being forced to contract and it will contract no matter what we do. And the question we now have to ask ourselves is if we're gonna face a future of declining GDP for some time, and we're also seeing that to some extent, um, the endless growth paradigm that we've been living on all this time is actually escalated these risks of disasters. 
And so really what we're seeing is, 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 is that where we need to be going? How can we reduce our material footprint rather than increasing it exponentially, but actually reduce it, but still flourish within planetary boundaries? And is that even possible? I think the good news is that there's so much really sound research that shows that it is possible. And there's one um, study uh, by uh, Julia Steinberger and a number of other people. She was one quarter, but she's the person that I know uh, very well. She's an, uh, an IPCC author. She's an ecological economist out of, she was at the University of Leeds, but I think she's moved to Switzerland. She's done so much work on this kind of stuff. And her recent study um, basically showed that you can actually reduce GDP by something like 40% um, and still grow your population out to about 10 billion people and provide a really um, good quality of life. And they went really into fine tuned detail. You know, they were looking at, can people wash their clothes and <laughs> transport networks and can they be an IT infrastructure and stuff like that. And it was quite exciting because they showed that you could have all sorts of modern amenities, you know, a strong transport network, um, a really strong internet and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, enough food to, and even stuff like having, um, uh, a kind of a really comfortable living temperature 24 hours uh, around the world um, so all of this stuff could be sustained at that level with a shift to renewable energies and but the right restructuring of wealth distribution and so on and so forth so we know it's possible we know we can do this and it's a case of, of getting there um, but I think as part of that we do need to look at those you know those kind of really specific things and that's why and I've, I've really emphasized the role of deforestation as an important kind of frontline issue that we have to tackle. Because even though deforestation perhaps wasn't the trigger point for this pandemic, you know, I think it was mostly these industrial processes and how they, they concentrated in China with these specific consumption, consumption practices with, you know, different types of wildlife in the wet markets and so on and so forth. You know, there's still some uncertainty around it, but we know from the genetic footprint of the virus that you know, this was a natural virus most likely and it came from this kind of practice. So we know that the industrial expansion and the urban expansion is, is going out of control in the way we're doing things. But all of the studies are saying that if we continue kind of going into our forests in the way we're doing, especially in the tropical regions, that risk that we've seen in China is just going to escalate in an uncontrolled way. And, you know, we're going to increase the probability of these viruses jumping to humans because of the increased contact. And there was one study um, which said that there's something like up to 600,000 um, kind of unknown viruses circulating amongst wildlife um, in, in, um, that we don't know. And that study basically said that even under the, two, uh, the current level of carbon emissions and global temperatures under two degrees Celsius, there is go that 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 trajectory of that kind of jumping of virus of those exotic viruses to humans will happen again, um, and we won't be able to do anything about it, even within that two degrees thing. So that that shows that we're already we're in this danger zone now. You know, we, we've we've entered this kind of age of ecological emergencies, and they're intersecting. So tackling deforestation for me is one of the most important things to do, and I think the only way to do it. Is to is to basically have some uh, consistent approach to the commodities which are really driving deforestation, and that is we really have to clamp down. I mean, there's a lot of excessive focus on on palm oil as if palm oil is the fundamental driver of deforestation. And it's interesting because palm oil is 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 of course involved in deforestation, but it's not the biggest driver. It's actually beef consumption and soy together, which are absolutely just crazy amount i think it's like a third of deforestation is beef alone and you add soy and it becomes it starts to approach nearly half and palm oil i think is something like 14 or oil seeds generally about 14 percent and palm oil is a part of that so there is this strange mismatch going on in the environment movement um and in in policy making like in the eu and elsewhere where there's been and i think it's partly to do with this silo thinking that we have going on but also i think there's the impact of the European Union, for example, you know, they introduced a ban on palm oil for biodiesel uh, a couple of uh, years ago, um, which I found odd that they did that, but then their beef consumption is rocketing and 
they said this is all about stopping deforestation. And at the same time, they're trying to forge trade deals with you know, Brazil. Um, but they won't have anything to do with countries like Malaysia because they're saying, well, this deforestation. It's clearly, this is not about deforestation. There's something else going on here. This is kind of, this is politics, protectionism, something else. Maybe your own biofuel industries you're trying to protect. So there's some kind of strange thing going on there. And I think what we need to do is let's, you know, extract ourselves from the short-term politics of it and let's say, look, if we're serious about deforestation, we need to stop deforestation around palm oil, we need to stop deforestation around rapeseed, around sunflower, around soy, around beef. We need to, we need to, we need to, to stop, we need to stop it now. Um, and what really drove this home to me actually was a, a study I covered um, a couple of months ago, I think it was in August, um, for, uh, published in Nature Scientific Reports by, by two theoretical physicists who just modeled the rate of deforestation. And they said, if the rate of deforestation continues as it is now, um, over the next two to four decades, civilization will collapse. And they said this is because of the impact of the, of the deforestation on these kind of crucial life support system processes around the carbon cycle and stuff like that. And that, that was really kind of really shocking for me um, because obviously we have lots of other studies which talk about near-term collapse risks, which, you know, is very, which are uncertain, but, you know, they're worst case scenarios. So to have something like that um, was quite, you know, from physicists as well, doing this kind of modeling was really sobering. So it says to me that, you know, this is kind of the front line of the crisis and we need to kind of reduce consumption demand within the West, as well as have more robust approaches um, within these countries. And I think there is good news here. The good news is that in some, in places like Malaysia, um, which I'm quite familiar with, because I've been there and I've spoken to some of the people there, um, they've had a lot more progress um, with slowing the rate of deforestation. And there was a recent an observation by um, Mighty Earth, one of the biggest kind of anti-deforestation NGOs, where they said, if we're able to do what we're doing in places like Malaysia, because of the local certification schemes that they have, it's the first um, mandatory certification scheme that they have in Malaysia co uh, called uh, MSPO. Um, and it's not perfect, far from perfect, and there's still issues there, and there's still deforestation, but it's gone down from something like a million acres per year to less than 250,000 acres per year, which is a dramatic decline. So they're saying if you can scale that up and use that kind of model where you've got satellite technology, um, you know, warnings from external stakeholders, NGOs and others, and local government, the government monitoring and enforcing those things locally with the palm oil industry, um, you can actually have huge changes. Let's take that kind of model and use it in the Amazon. Um, but how do we do that? We need some kind of a framework to do that. So what I've been saying is, instead of saying, okay, the trade, you know, we've, the, we've been working, trying to have trade deals with Brazil, go in there with ecological restoration as your fundamental baseline principle underlying your, your, your approach to trade. So again, it's not gonna work if you don't have that shift in mindset. Once you've realized that you need that lifeboat economy approach and restoring your ecosystems is the only way you're gonna secure that, make that the foundation of your trade deal. So when you're negotiating with Brazil, you have a no nonsense approach where you're saying, and countries like Malaysia or, and other producers, saying that, look, we, we're happy to trade with you, we're happy to give you access to our market, but it's only going to be in this, on this condition, um, where we have to have sustainable production. Um, but, and also apply those kind of standards consistently to yourself. So producers in, in Europe and the West are also adhering to, to standards. So I think there needs to be this really radical shift in the way we're thinking about things to, to, to what we think is possible. And I think in a way the pandemic has has it has opened up this possibility to do some of these things which maybe a few years ago we would have said that's just not going to be politically possible whereas now i think actually we can think outside the box and we can make these seemingly semi-utopian ideas we can bring them into the political domain and say well actually let's do this we can this is the time when we can achieve a dramatic shift and that i think can be the the, the grounding for saying now that we're moving to that approach let's create a whole new economic infrastructure where we share 
ecological goods and services, you know, where Europe can say we're, you know, we're innovating with the Green New Deal, we're throwing so much money into renewable infrastructure, infrastructure. This is our IP, we can we can make this available to you, and so on and so forth. So we're transitioning much more rapidly towards this clean energy infrastructure and beginning to move into a slightly more resilient system. I think it's really helpful to get into the the nitty gritty of these specific policies as you're doing um, the fees and, and other colleagues, academics, journalists, practitioners, and to prioritize and to break it down. And a lot of people, I think, do feel very overwhelmed by climate change. Uh, we can think of sort of Timothy Morton's idea of the hyper object. So how do we make how do we make these problems kind of micro issues to, to, to tackle? And I think that's a great example. Um, so I am conscious of your time. I want to say thanks so much for taking on all of these incredibly big, challenging questions and providing such clarity. It's been really helpful. Um, to end, perhaps, um, as you've said, you know, we are now in possibly a danger zone. Many argue that this is a crucial decade for action, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, of course. What would you say to any of our students who are watching or listening and wondering what can they do, what can we do as individuals now, how, how do we play our part in trying to shift systems in the direction of ecological civilization? Yeah, I mean, I get asked that a lot. And um, I think my main, and it's something I grappled with myself, you know, is, you know what, what, what can I do as an individual? And I think the first step is to realize that you're not going to, as an individual, be able to change the world. You know, there's going to be all sorts of things you're looking at and you're, you're not going to be able to change those things. Um, but you can start with your own context. And I think the first step is, I think what we're looking at when we're looking at these kinds of the system change that we need is we're looking at a process where individuals are scaling the ability to, to see and think holistically enacting that in their context, using that in, in, for example, where you work, where you study, where you play, your family, your friends, networks, that's your arena of immediate action and change. Um, and when you can begin to scale that systems awareness within that context, and your task in that sense is to simply act as like a domino effect, so that other people then around you can take on the same, begin to take on the same kind of a holistic thinking and again, keep spreading it. And eventually at some point as, as students, you, you, you'll find that your arena of action will be different. You know, you'll, you, you know, you'll be able to do a lot more activism, you're able to engage in different societies, you'll be able to do different kinds of campaigns. And you want to bring that sense of whole systems approach into the way you do those things. But then you're paving the way to get yourself into a position where, you know, hopefully you will be, you know, you have secure livelihood or secure kind of pathway. Um, and wherever you're going in that direction, you want to be able to take that capacity to now think systemically and act systemically into your organization, into where you're going to go. And again, to keep scaling that. And I think that's the key. I, I think the big insight that I had was realizing that it's, of course, you know, we want to keep engaging with government, we want to keep doing our political campaigning, we want to keep being in the room with these people and doing all that kind of stuff. And also being on the outside and being on the streets and, you know, doing Extinction Rebellion and that kind of protest, you need all of that kind of stuff. But really, fundamentally, what's going to shift this is more and more people in these different institutions themselves being able to actually see what's going on and being able to realise, well, now that I can see the system, this is the kind of action that I can change, whether I'm a politician, whether I'm head of an energy company, whether I'm a banker, um, whether I'm working in policy, to be able to see systemically and then take that action in that context. And I think that's the key is, is being able to scale that process of systemic change. So when you realize that actually you have a huge amount of power in that sense as, a, as, as an individual to focus on upgrading yourself, as someone who's able to see and think in systems and and then scale that process around you where, where, where the most immediate forms of action are available to you. That's really, really critical. Um, and that's how we're going to create, create change. And that's how I think we're going to be able to do this. 
I suppose uh, we as academics can play our part by ensuring that uh, it's on the syllabus <laughs> systems thinking. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Nafis. It's been really great. Um, you know, we wish you the very best in, in your work. We'll be following it. And hopefully post COVID, we might be able to get you into UCL for an event at some point. <laughs> I'd love that. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Imperfect Utopias. To get access to all of our content and to stay up to date with future Zoom calls, workshops and events and more, check us out at ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. If you like this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. Until next time. <laughs>